Good morning and happy Sabbath and uh, happy first Sabbath of the year. It's, um, I, I haven't seen you in a while, actually, in a year, <laughs> some of you. So, uh, and as I'm looking over the, the congregation today, I realize that there are many of you which I don't know who you are. And uh, um, I hope I will have the privilege to know you and be of use. I want to uh, say something about this ad, about the depression training. Uh, it was not my idea. It was idea, the idea of Susan Jen, if you know her, and I think uh, um, Dr. Chung and a few others, they want to do a training on, on how to um, hold on, uh, how to, to present or to facilitate a depression class, a depression recovery, and, and mental health. Um, so if any one of you is interested, uh, you can join this event. They organize it. I am just going to um, present. It's going to be next uh, Sunday, 1 to 4. It's in the middle of the day. But if any one of you is interested in attending the event, the event is not only for the church, but if you want to do something like this at your home or you want to invite your neighbors and friends and say, well, by the way, I have a program at my house. Come and it's a, you know, uh, you can do it as your personal uh, ministry if you want to, if you are interested in. Uh, before we, when we begin our study today, um, let, us, uh, let us pray one more time. Father in heaven, we have come this morning to meet with you and to meet with one another. We want to listen to you uh, as you speak to us. Give us discernment and understanding and may we, uh, may we leave this place with um, a practical application to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, a few uh, technical questions. Uh, one of them is, how many of you uh, like PowerPoint? Uh, it's, it's for me to know. I'm just looking around to see. It, it helps me to know if I should waste my time in putting a PowerPoint together or not. How many of you don't like a PowerPoint? If my wife would be here, she would, she would raise her hand because my wife doesn't like it. But okay, so it seems that the majority decides, so I'll, I'll try to continue. Not always, but sometime when I think it's, it's useful. The title of the sermon today, the study, um, am I on? Am I on? Am I on? No, I'm not. Um, uh, is it now? Uh, maybe now. Is it now? Okay, 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 thank you. I apologize for that. So the title of the sermon is Preparing for the Storm, Building for Eternity. The, the, the current events, um, Alina is not here today simply because she was afraid of the getting stuck somewhere because of the floods. She was traveling 99 in Sacramento area or in other places. She said, I'm not coming. I'm afraid that I get stuck somewhere. I'm by myself. I'm going to stay in Fresno. And I said, well... Um, We'll, we'll apply a fee for that, but you can stay there. And, and, and she, anyway, she decided to stay there. Hopefully not for long because Lord's willing in two weeks she'll actually, in one week actually she should be home and begin work in Clear Lake. But the events that happened this last two weeks really made me think and, and as, as it mentioned, I, I think one of the days, I don't know if it was Thursday morning or Wednesday morning when I was, communicating with Brother Bill and he was in the evening and she said, Pastor, trees are falling down and, and oh, the power is out. And, and I said, well, this is serious business. And then I got out of the house and the wind was so strong. I mean, so strong. I, I mean, I, I, I've never seen such a wind uh, so strong. I said, it is scary. And... Um, I said, maybe this is the time to look into the Bible in a parable that Jesus told us and to try to look deeper into, into the subject. Because what happens up in the heavens has a consequence of what happens down on earth, right? Both in the physical and in the spiritual way. So what happens up in heavens has a consequence on what happens down on earth. So as you can see in this picture, because of the flooding and the storms, one house is standing while the other one has collapsed. So does it make 
if you prepare for the storm? Does it make a difference? Well, definitely it does. So today I will invite you to look into this parable that Jesus told us, because Jesus told the parable not only with the application for the first century, but for the continuing centuries. And if it has an application, probably it has for our days today, because we are looking in the future, and what we, I mean, what the Bible predicts about the future, it's actually, as they use the term, the coming of the big one, right? You know, the coming of the big one. Um, and so today, I will invite you to take notes. And I'm trying to go um, fast enough because I, I have a problem. Sometimes I, I put too much of the material in a, in a study. And even I would like to give a few minutes for questions at the end. Uh, so think that this hopefully would be a, um, a, a time when you, you will benefit out of it. The Bible passage again, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and bit on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But Jesus, you know, it's interesting because Jesus doesn't did, Jesus didn't tell the sugary stories to his audience. He didn't preach to them to make them feel good. That, that, that was not his purpose. His purpose was to prepare them in, in, uh, for heaven and for life events and for the spiritual battle that exists. And Jesus added to the sermon. He could have stopped at the first, uh, with the first story. But he added to his sermon and he said, but everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. So the Bible in the story, there are a few points implied in the story. One is that every builder, everybody is building something. You, me, we all build something every day of life. Secondly, we build, how we build will make a dramatic difference. So how we build is going to make a difference. Third, in good times, in good times, well, it's fine, right? Um, fourth, the storm is coming. The question is uh, not if it's coming, if it's not going to come. We know, according to the Bible, the storm is coming, both in the personal life and in global life of the Na nations and humanity, the storm is coming. No time for repairs during the storm. It's too late. Um, I, with this rain, lots of rain, I went, I mean, we bought this new home, and I said, let me check the house. This, I mean, the new storm, the, the storm, it's the, the raining. Let me see, are there leaks somewhere? Is the water coming in somewhere? I know the few tiles are missing on my roof. And I am afraid to go up the roof because it's a tall roof and I am afraid to go up there. Uh, and uh, I said, I know the tiles. There is no time for me to repair the roof now. I mean, we can talk about this tomorrow if you are interested. But the point is no repairs during the storm. It's too late to do the repairs during the storm. Some will stand and some will fall. Today, we enjoy life, we are together, we sing together, we pray together, eat together, discuss together. It's fine, it's good, wonderful. The, in the parable, Jesus says that in the end, when the storm comes, some will stand and some will fall. Those of you who think that you will be falling, please raise up your hand. I don't see anybody. None of us wants to fall, right? We all want to stand. I pray that would be the case. I pray about myself, my family, I pray about you. And the reason why we are here today is that because you want to prepare for the storm and you want to stand when the storm hits. I would like to read a passage from the uh, book, actually, Child Guidance. Uh, to a great extent, everyone is what? Who's the architect? Each one. 
You are the ar architect. I am the architect. You build, you build this house. There's nobody else. You make the design. You put the materials. It is you and it is me. To a great extent, everyone is the architect of his own character. Every day, the structure more nearly approaches the completion, which means that we build this every day. The Word of God warns us to take heed how we build, how we build, to see that our building is found, founded upon the eternal rock. The time is coming when our work will stand revealed just as it is, meaning now we're all good. The time will come when it, it will be shown if we are standing or not. Now is the time for all to cultivate the powers that God has given them, that they may form characters for usefulness here and for a higher life after. So what we build today is not for a future event only, but actually we build for eternity. We build for etern eternity. So this is the core uh, concept of our study today. The question is, and it's again, it's derived from the, the story of Jesus, from the parable of Jesus. How shall we build to stand? Because we understand, well, a storm is coming, I need to build, I need to stand. Well, the question is, what am I supposed to do, right? So today, if you don't mind, follow me in the study. And um, I, I hope, I don't know what else I can... I don't know what can I do to make you attentive and, and, and to perceive. If, if there's anything I can do, you tell me. Because I want you to use, to make the best use of your time today here. If you feel you're falling asleep, don't mind standing. I don't mind that. And say, well, um, that was a custom in my grandmother's church in the countryside. When someone would, it happened to me, to fall asleep during the sermon. And it's the fault of the preacher always. But if that happens to you, don't mind, stand up, go there in the back of the church until, and drink a glass of water and come back. Make use of the time. How shall we build? So I'm going to use my expertise as a builder today. And I apologize to you, the professionals. And I, I, I don't mind your advice after the sermon is over. How can I? But I'm going to use this illustration of building of a house to really apply to spiritual matters. So as Jesus told the story about the house, so I'll do today. I will use the illustration of building a house to answer the question, how shall I build to stand from the spiritual point of view? So when you build a house, what do you put first? The foundation, right? You have to have a foundation. And I remember being a child, my, my parents, we, had a, we lived first of all in a very small house two rooms, and then my parents begin to build a house. And I remember digging the trenches, digging the trenches where you have to put the cement and then putting the, 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 the how do you call the metal bars that you put, the rebarbs? Yeah, the rebarbs. And I remember my father would ask me to use the, the, some wires and to tie them and do this and do that, helping there as a child. I remember putting the foundation. And then I remember pouring the concrete, and we did it by hand. We didn't have a, you know, a nice truck comes in. And we did the whole thing by hand, and I remember putting rocks and stones, many stones and rocks and cement. We were building the foundation, right? You put a foundation. And Jesus speaks actually about the foundation. And so the first element in the building is the foundation. The next element, I'm sorry, the next element, obviously you have to put up the structure. We call that the frame, framing of the house. Especially here in the United States, it's easy to see the frame because you see all the sticks, right? And, and we, I mean, the people coming from Europe, they, they sometimes make, make jokes of the way we build the houses here in the States, and they say, well, it's a stick house. And because they build it differently, they build with bricks. But even if you, and, uh, even if you build with bricks, you just don't put the bricks together, you have to have a frame for the bricks. You have to have a structure and you build a structure, and the structure is actually made of cement and rebarbs. So you, if between bricks, so your bricks hold together. You have to have a structure. And when you build the walls, you actually pour cement on top. I don't know how you call that in English, but I remember that we pour a, a, a cement in the top to actually hold the whole structure together. 
the structure is fundamentally important for a house. The next level, then you actually do the kind of a finishing work. You put the walls, you do the painting, you put, the, you put everything else, and you, you know, that, that's basically when, when you put the foundation, you build the structure, and basically you don't, usually you do not see the foundation, and you do not see the structure. All you see is this exterior work. What's the name for that? I mean, for this third level of the foundation, the structure, what would be the next? The facade? Oh, that works. The facade, the, si the, the, you know, the finishing work. So that's the, the, the process. But also, when you put a building together, the building has to have a purpose. And actually, you put the, um, you know, at the top or somewhere there, you say, well, smile dentistry or Jimmy's mechanic shop, or Howard's law firm, or happy church, whatever. You put something there on the top, which actually explains why did you build the whole thing, right? It explains what is the purpose of that building. So, number one is, oh, <clears throat> number one is, number two, number three, and number four, purpose. the purpose. So that is the process of building. Now let's take this process and apply the process to the spiritual life. Are you okay with me so far? Is my expertise in building homes good enough? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So let's see how do we apply that to the spiritual life because actually that's very important. The foundation. The first question today, there will be a number of questions, all of them related to these segments. The first question today is, what is at the foundation of my life? What is, is there any foundation for my life? Or there is nothing there? It's just sand. What is at the foundation of my life? Is it myself? I am building my life on self? On myself? What is at the foundation? Is there a foundation, first of all? Right. The question is, what is at the foundation of life? I was talking yesterday. I, uh, I saw one of my neighbors, and he doesn't come too often there. And I have to be in good relationship with him because he has a swimming pool. <laughs> and and I, don't have it, I don't need a swimming pool now. But well, the summer is coming, and I know that. So... I saw my neighbor, and he, again, he lives in, in the Bay Area, but he comes here on and on. And, and I said, well, I go to, well, it was raining, he's cleaning his gutters, we begin to talk. And as usually the case is, we ended up in, and for me, there is one, one, way, one easy way to connect with people on spiritual things, because they, most of the people ask you, what do you do, right? So when they ask me, what do you do? And I know that's coming. I said, well, I'm a pastor. What's the next question? Where? Which church? I say, well, I'm, and that's, that's what he did. He said, what do you do, by the way? And he said, well, oh, I, I am a pastor. And he says, oh, a pastor. And he says, uh, are you a Catholic? He said, uh, no, I'm not. He says, then which church? And I said, Seventh-day Adventist. And then I ask him, have you heard of that? I says, no, I haven't. He has never heard of the Seventh-day Adventist. He didn't know what that is. And we begin to talk a little bit, and then we begin to say, well, I said, before we talk about the, court, the church, there are a few fundamental questions few fundamental questions of life. The first of them is, where do I come from? Why am I here? What's the purpose and destiny of life? These are beginning of some of the fundamental questions of life. The question, that, that's called the world view. It deals with what are you building your life on? What are you building on? Well, <clears throat> according to the Bible, for Christians, Christ is the foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation at the foundation of Christianity is Jesus Christ. What is at the foundation of the Muslim faith? What is, is the, at the foundation? It's Mohammed at the foundation of the Muslim faith is Muhammad. What is at the foundation at the Buddhist faith? What is it? It's Buddha, right? Buddha. At the, 
in China, one of the national religion of the Chinese is the Confucianism. I think that's the way you say it. Do I say it right? What is at the foundation? Confucius and his teachings. At the foundation of Christianity is Jesus Christ, his life and his teachings. And um, that is at the foundation. We have the song, you know, in times like this. I was even thinking to ask the pianist, but I, I think she, she went out. Uh, I was thinking to sing together this beautiful song. In times like this, you need a savior. In times like this, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is? He is the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. What a beautiful song, right? In the end, at the foundation, the foundation of Christianity and Christian life is a personal relationship with Christ. And <clears throat> it, as we read about Christ, when we read about Christ, we speak about two things. The things he did and the things he taught. When we speak about Christ, what are the two things? The things he did, we look at his life, and the things he taught. So Christianity deals with the things Jesus did and the things that Jesus taught. When we look at Christ's life, the Bible says that he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. And the Bible says that sometimes Christ spent how much in prayer? Sometimes all night. Sometimes we'll be gone for days. So as we look at the life example, we see that even at his own foundation of life was what we called the devotional life. His connection with the Father. His connection with God was at the foundation of Jesus' life himself as he was on earth, right? So, the devotional life, which represents my personal relationship with Jesus, it is the foundation of Christianity. The, the devotional life means time spent in prayer, meditation and reflection, Bible study, singing, fasting. They are all we call parts of the devotional life. I'm going to say this again. The foundation of Christianity is the devotional life of the individual. Your devotional life, it is actually what we build the rest of it. And this is fundamentally important. And I hope you keep this in mind as we evolve in this study together. What is at the foundation of Christian life? A personal relationship with Jesus, with Christ, with God, right? We express that in the time in prayer. People that do not have time to pray, they build their house on what? On the sand. It's superficial. It's not going to stand. People that do not take time for personal reflection and meditation, they are building their spiritual life on the sand. Is not going to stand. It may look nice today, good, and this and that. Is not going to stand. People that do not find time to commune with God in His Word, they are not going to stand. They are building on sand. Is not going to work. People that do not have time to commune with God in singing and in, in spiritual disciplines, sometimes they call them, is not going to work. I have a question today. I'm not going to ask. Uh, I, I, I have a survey. I didn't bring it with me. I didn't have time to print it and this. In the survey, I ask, uh, it's an anonymous, an anonymous survey. People don't have to put their name. But I ask them, what's your time in prayer? How much time do you spend every day in, in your devotional life? Less than 15 minutes? Less than a half an hour or up to half an hour, an hour? And I do not have a standard. I don't say, if you do not spend uh, 47 minutes a day, you are lost. Uh, I, I don't say that. That's not for me to decide. I'm not saying anything like that. But I can tell you one thing for sure. If I do not have a devotional life, I'm going to collapse. And so you. So is going to happen to you. So because this is the first Sabbath, this is the beginning of the year. As I am speaking, is there anybody here that thought and said, well, maybe I would like, this is the beginning of the year. 
I would like to strengthen my devotional life. I would like to, to spend more time with God. Is there anybody here that would like to, to do that? I see, I saw a young man raising his hand. I have a gift for you. A book. You may not like to read. No problem. You have uh, the whole year to read it. It's a short devotional. It begins, it takes probably three minutes to read one page. It begins with a short devotional. And then it gives you a few thoughts. You don't have to begin with the whole Bible. Begin just with one verse a day. If you like it, I would be more than happy to give it to you. What's your name? Jesse. Jesse. Nice meeting you again. I have another question. You see, we need time for personal reflection. Uh, we need time to, to think of ourselves. If, you know, when you build a house, first of all, you have to make some plans, right? No, nobody, I, I guess nobody does. I mean, I, I've tried to build a few things, and they, they are looking like this. And, and I don't have to give too many examples. That, anyway, I put some tiles, and when my wife and my son came to see what I did, they said, Dad, it's not right. It, it, it doesn't line up. And I said, don't tell anybody. Said, <laughs> and, and, but... The point is, you have to have a plan for spiritual growth. If there is no plan for spiritual growth, how are you going to grow? So, I was thinking of another question. Is there anybody here that would like to take time to reflection, for personal reflection and meditation? I have a journal. I began journaling a number of years ago. I wish I had done that before. So, I journal, meaning I write one page. When usually it's Friday night. Friday night after the week is gone, it, you know, everything gets quiet, and I just, I, I just take, usually I, I'm in bed, and, and I, I just write what happened through the week. Sometimes it's a month. I, I don't have always the time to do it. It takes a month. That, that's fine. And I write down. One of the purposes is I'm writing down about myself. I'm writing down about my falling, I'm writing down about my victories. I'm writing down about my challenges. Sometime I'm in the middle of a challenge, and I say, how is, this, how is God going to solve this problem? I'm writing it down. So when I read it a year from now, I'll get encouraged, because I look back and see, God, I was in trouble. I didn't know what's going to happen, but God found a solution. And here's the solution. So I encourage you to journal. Is anybody here that would like to journal, to begin journaling? It's the beginning of the year. Is there anybody? I'm looking for, I, I say, one hand here. Uh, okay. It does happen. It's, I have with me a, a journaling. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, you see you lost it. And uh, it's, uh, do you journal? I haven't started. My daughter is reading through it. Okay. Okay. Okay, it's for you. Next time when I come, I'm going to check it out. <laughs> no, no, no. Now, let me tell you, it's very personal. And I write in my journal in Romanian, so none of you can read. And I write in such a way that even Romanians would have a hard time writing, reading it. It's just for me. It's just sometimes it's hard for me to read it myself. But So I encourage you to develop this time for building the foundation of a spiritual life and actually be very intentional about it. If you are not intentional, I, I do not believe in chance. I'm not an evolutionist. I believe in design and I believe that we have to be intentional about doing things in, in order to, to, to stay. Uh, if, for, these are five books. Uh, it's called The Great Controversy Series. If you have never read these five books, say, five books? Well, they are thick books. But you have plenty of time to read them. The series of these five books, I, I know that there are many of you have read them here, right? How many of you read the series, five books? There's many of you. But those of you who have not, it's the beginning of the year. I will encourage you, take the Bible. Because all these five books, they actually take you from, the, from Genesis to Revelation. It's, it's I, my opinion, the best commentary of the Bible. The best commentary of the Bible, it's in these five books. It's simple enough, it's deep enough, 
It's just wonderful. Take the Bible. If you, you can get them for free on your phone, on your tablet. And if you say, Pastor, I don't need the phone. I don't like the tablets, but I would like to read them. If you are that person, I'll give you these books. If you commit yourself and said, I want to read, I don't like the phones, I don't like the tablets, I will provide the books for you. If I can't, Brother Bill will. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but what I would say, it's the beginning of the year. Commit yourself for a spiritual growth program. Take the Bible and say, I, I don't have to read a half an hour. F begin with 15 minutes, with 10 minutes, with whatever you, wherever you are, but begin somewhere and set up a strong foundation. Why? You need it. I need it. The storm is coming. You don't, you don't want to collapse. We must, it's a passage from the book Desire of Ages, which I love the passage. At a certain point in my life, I, I, I printed this passage and I put it on my mirror. So every morning when I shave there, I, I, I could see the passage. I love the passage. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is hushed. And in quietness we wait before him. The silence of the soul makes the voice of God more distinct. He bids us be still and know that I am God. This emphasizes, one more time, the significance and importance of the devotional life. And concluding about the foundation, the foundation for Christian faith and experience is the devotional life. It is the measure of our closeness, love to Christ. It is private, intimate, and unseen by human eye. Everything else depends on it. It is built on it. No devotional life, no Christianity, no chance to stand the storm. A strong devotional life continues for the rest of life, and it will never end, right? Why? Because it represents your and my relationship with Christ. It will never end. It is this intimate relationship and communion with Christ, right? So, another question which is, which is applicable to us as a group now. What is the value of devotional life for us as a church, for the Middletown Church? Do we as a church have a devotional life. There is an announcement about 10, weeks of, uh, 10 days of prayer. Do you plan to attend that? I understand, we are busy. If you can, I hope, I don't know if we'll have a Zoom possibility. We're still working on the Zoom. Okay. Uh, well, there is a prayer meeting. There is a prayer meeting during the week. How long is the prayer meeting, Brother Andrew? Oh, did you say three hours? He said one hour. One hour in the middle of the week for spiritual communion with the church family. Is that too much? I'm just asking. If it's too much, would half an hour be okay? If you say, I can't attend an hour, but a half an hour I will. Let me tell you something. Attend for a half an hour. There's not a problem. Attend for a half an hour. If it's an hour, it's too much. But I'm talking to us as a church family. The devotional life of a church it actually speaks lots about how we are doing as a church. And the Seventh Adventists, here we are. You are my family now. We as Seventh Adventists have a problem with devotional life as a group. Sometimes our prayer meetings are so poorly attended that you say, well, how am I going to invite someone else at the prayer meeting when, when the church family doesn't come? Right? And it doesn't have to be something that you say, well, I have to do it. Oh, man, I have to go. No, but you, you reason with me. You think about it. Well, the next thing in the building project is the structure. Then you have the foundation. You set up the foundation. Then you next, you, you build the structure. What's the purpose of the structure? Well, the structure builds, holds the building together. Do you have to have a solid structure or a weak structure? Do you put in your structure when you build rotten wood? Is that what you build it with? Do you put crooked wood? Well, we bought a shed for my son. He wanted to put a, build a shed. We bought it from Home Depot. 
And to our surprise, some of the two by fours, it's one of these, uh, you buy it in a package, comes in a box and you build it yourself. So we did the best to build it well anyway, but some of the wood was crooked. Some of the two by fours were not straight, were like this. They gave us a hard time. Where it worked, right? When the wood is like this, can you work with it? You can, but it's difficult. You want to have a straight piece, solid wood to build your frame. You want to have a good frame. Well, spiritually, what is the frame? Well, I met people saying, we are looking for a home church. Have you met people saying, we just moved recently in town and we are looking for a home church? Have you met people saying that? I've met people saying that. We moved in the area, we are looking for the home church. Can you guess what is my question to them? You, what, what would you ask them? <laughs> yeah, okay. My question is, how are you going to find your home church? Based on, based on what, right? If you are looking for a home church, I ask them, how are you going to find it? Well, I was looking in, um, on the internet quickly to see how many churches are in Middletown. And I thought, First Baptist, Middletown Bible Church, Jesus Christ Fellowship Methodist, Middletown Community. I found even the Adventists. So, Heart Conscientious Church, I found this Adinam Holy Institution. What is this? I have no clue. Uh, St. Joseph Catholic, Adinam Pan Communion. Oh, when I saw that, I kind of have an idea about what that might be. Something Oriental, something uh, Middle East or some Hindu Buddhist, something of that kind. They listed the worship places, worship places in Middletown. My question is, how, how are you going to choose based on what? Well, uh, people go to church because tradition and local culture. I've heard people saying, well, I was born a Catholic, I'm going to stay a Catholic. I was born an Orthodox, I'm going to stay an Orthodox. I was born a so-and-so, I'm going to stay there. Other people say, well, my, all my family goes to the church. All my family goes there, and because my family goes there, I'm going there with them. Other people say, well, I, I go there because I, I, you know, I need emotional support. Uh, emotional People go there for emotional needs, emotional and social needs. People go there because they say, well, I'm going to go to that church because they help me financially. They pay for my bills, they pay for my kids in school, they help me when I got in trouble. Some people go to church for these kind of reasons. Um, other people go, I like to this church because I like, I, like the, I like the environment. I like the music, people are fun. I, I, just, I just like to be there. Uh, other people go to a church because they say, well, they have good programs. Well, I hope we can have good programs, but I say, oh, I'm going to this church because they have good programs. Other people go, I go there because they have something, they gave me something to do. It gives purpose and meaning. Other people go to church. I went to the church because I, I felt. I went to a number of churches, but when I, go to, I went to this church, I felt this way and that way. Is this the reason to choose a church? Why are you coming to the Seventh-day Adventist church? Or why don't you go to the Baptist, Methodist? Are you coming to this church because in this church these are the best people in town? Is this why you come to this church? Of course. All right. Well, I'm not coming to the Seventh-day Adventist church because in the Seventh-day Adventist church are the best people in town. I know that there are lots of good people in church. But I'm not, be I'm not beginning with the assumption that the best people in town come to this place. So the question is, why am I choosing a church? Why am I not a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witnesses or something else? The question when you choose a church is, what do I believe and why I believe what I believe? The church deals with beliefs and teachings. That is actually the structure of a church, the structure of the spiritual life is built on beliefs and principles, otherwise called doctrines. And Jesus spoke of doctrines, for example, in Matthew 7, 28, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his, anybody reading with me? Doctrine. In Paul writes about the word doctrine a number of times, but one of the passages says, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. What does the word doctrine mean? 
What does it mean? It means actually simple teaching. It is a teaching. Teachings, right? Christianity is based on the teachings of Jesus, right? Christianity is based on the doctrines established by Jesus Christ, as we find them in the Bible in the Old and the New Testament. So, in Matthew, actually, Jesus says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. So I am with you. So part of the Jesus, we call it the Great Commission, is that you go, in making disciples means actually you teach people the things about God. You begin to build a spiritual structure. We call that theology, which is the science about God. Theology actually answers the fundamental question. The fundamental question is, who is God? In the theology school, you study a discipline which is called systematic theology. It's one of the most boring disciplines during the school time. But when you finish that, there comes a time when you look back and say, well, let me look at these things. Because the fundamental question in finding a church, it's the answer to this question, what do they believe? And many people, honest people, when they are searching for God, they are searching for God. They are not searching for a church. They are searching for God. When they are searching for God, they are looking for a church that will explain who God is. And one of their questions is, what do you actually believe? And people ask me, oh, you're a Seventh-day Adventist. The next question is, what do you believe? They are not asking me, are the best people in town in your church? They are not asking me, do you have good programming in the church? They are not asking me, do you have good music? Do you have potlucks? They are not asking me any of these questions. They are asking me one question. What do you believe? The structure of faith, it's actually made of beliefs. In preparing for the storm, you have to have a solid uh, structure. A, a solid system of beliefs. In Ephesians, the Bible says, wind of doctrine. You know, we talk about the storm. In the spiritual sense, part of the storm are these ideas that are floating around and are shaking the faith of many other people. And the Bible says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Are there winds of doctrines blowing around the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Are they? Well, before that, by the way, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has 28 fundamental beliefs. If you have never read them, I'm sure you've read them, you've heard them, take your time and read them. Not only that, I would say, study them well. So when someone asks you, what do you believe? Well, I believe this and I believe that. And you take the Bible and you would be able to explain to them, show them in the Bible what you believe and why. Coming back to my question, wind of doctrine is blowing in the Seventh Adventist Church. Here are a few, a few, just a few of them. Jesus versus doctrines, God doesn't kill, 1888 and righteous by faith. I mean, many of these are good ideas, but people take some ideas to such an extreme and they twist them around. They mess up the minds of other people. Trinity question, Jesus, is Jesus eternal with God or not? As I, as I think I've mentioned, I have dearly friends of mine, intelligent people. We've known each other for... 40 years. And for a number of weeks by now, we discuss this question. Is what they are, what they are telling me, they, they have discovered something new and they say, Jesus was born of the Father. Um, and I said, so you believe that Jesus has a beginning? Oh, yeah, yeah, somewhere in the infinity of time. Yes, he has a beginning. And the next, the next thing is that the Holy Spirit is not actually an entity in himself, but is the influence of the Father that comes from the Father and from Jesus. So, and and I, we've been, again, these are my friends. They're in Europe. Again, they, uh, he's a doctor. He's a very good doctor. His wife is a teacher. And they have a son who's a great son. And... Again, yesterday I had a two hours conversation again with them about this topic. Very difficult, uh, very difficult to deal with. And, and I told them yesterday, I said, 
Because they bring Bible passages, they bring Ellen White quotes, and they bring this and this and this and that. And I said, at one point, I said, we both look at the same cow, and you say, it's a cow. And I say, no, I'm sorry, I see a horse. You say, yeah, but it has four legs. True, it has four legs. But both the cows and the horse have four legs, but the cow and the horse is not one and the same thing. So we read the same Bible passages, we read the same passages from Ellen White, but what we see, it's different. I, I'm talking about how some of these ideas are messing up the, the minds of the people. I don't know if you know about this 2520. If you don't know, you didn't lose much. But I know churches that have fallen apart. I, I've known in a church, the husband was an elder, the wife was the uh, wife of the elder, and they split. I mean, she was believing one thing, he was believing another thing. The church split over this thing with 2520 issue. By the way, I, I'm thinking to organize what, what I call simply a Bible conference. Maybe a few times a year, maybe twice a year, to organize a Bible conference for the area, uh, our, the churches or people in the area, and invite um, speakers and choose topics and, and have a Bible conference like in the old days where we study the Bible, deal with difficult issues, which are pertaining to the Seventh-day Adventists in particular. These are not evangelistic meetings. This would be, I mean, Bible studies for us. I don't know if you would be interested in something like this, but this is what I'm thinking to do. I'm thinking, I know some of the old professors of theology, and, and I would like to invite them. They are solid people, studied the Bible for a long time, um, and on and on. But why? Because I think you need a solid structure. If the winds are blowing, you better have a solid structure. If not, you fall. And you have all kinds of ideas, spirit of prophecy questions, questions on prophetic interpretation, practicing LGBT as members. This is another question that's kind of floating in the area, in the Seventh-day Adventist circles. Are you still with me? I lost you. <laughs> um, the structure, the principles, the beliefs, and the doctrines. The doctrines shall never be separated from the foundation. Are we clear on that, right? So the structure, you just don't put the structure on nothing. It's built on Christ. They shall, be solid, they shall be solidly grounded in the Bible and prayerfully studied. They give stability, purpose, and peace when correctly understood. Am I able to share, explain my beliefs to others? One of the advantages of going through a theological school is that, at least in my case, I, I, didn't, I didn't graduate in theology in the United States graduated in theology in my home country, so still under the communism. The entrance exam at the theology, at the seminary at that point, was that you, 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 there was the 27 fundamental beliefs at that time. The entrance exam was theology, written exam, language, written exam, and an oral assessment. So you had to pass an exam on fundamental biblical teachings. In other words, you, you, were, you, you were supposed to be able to explain what you believe on any of the 20 fundamental, 27 fundamental beliefs of the church. And that was good for me, because it, I, I knew what I believed, but I didn't have it structured. And it helped me to know at any time afterwards when anybody would say, what do you believe on death? What I believe in death, about death, this, 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 and this, it is written here, 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 and there. So if, if you would be interested, in, in, in learning how to do that, we may have a training school for how to be able to explain fundamental beliefs. Does Middleton, uh, Middletown says the church have a solid, well-built biblical theological structure? It's a question for you. I do not know you very well. I'm just beginning to know you a little bit about you. You know, when I was interviewed by the search committee, it was a very brief uh, meeting with the people. I didn't know much about I actually didn't know anything about you. So, but in my mind, I'm asking these questions and I'm asking these questions openly. The first one to ask would be the church elders. Do you have, do we have as a church a solid structure in belief? Or we believe, or we, or we have some, some of the beliefs are kind of windy. We believe that, ah, no, we're not sure about this, we're not. If you have a problem with the fundamental teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you let me know, and you better let me soon, because I'm looking for another job. 
I'm joking, but it, this is it's serious because I cannot be the pastor of a church who doesn't have a solid structure fundamentally. And by the way, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Th that's what I am. By beliefs and by choice. And then by profession. Um, the next thing is the exterior. You know, the foundation is in the ground, the structure is covered, and then it's the exterior of a house. When you look at the house, hopefully you don't see the beam, the, the, the two by fours, right? Uh, hopefully you do not see holes in through the walls or through the paint. This is, you know, actually this is the exterior of the faith. In the building process, people don't see the foundation and they don't see the structure. But what they see is the way I live. It, the, what they see is the practical Christianity. So, what is this? You know, in, in the story we read in the beginning, Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him. So, the fundamental part of faith is how do we live day to day my faith, my Christianity. Have you heard of non-practicing Christians? Have you heard of non-practicing Christians? I've heard people saying that, but I don't understand that. Because if someone is a Christian, the assumption is they practice, right? Jesus says, who does them? The, the third question for today is, how is my theology, my beliefs, and my doctrines reflected in my daily practice? I have also to say that I have a problem as a pastor. When I go into a neighborhood and we move into a neighborhood, very soon, people somehow, people talk. People talk. I was living in Bakersfield. We bought this condominium. I begin to interact with a few people, my neighbors, and one of the days I met one of the ladies, someone who I've never seen her, and she said, are you the pastor? I said, I am. I said, how do you know? They said, well, people talk. All right. Then people talk about who you are, and, and you know, when, people, when people know that I am a pastor, how do you think I'm going to behave? Well, I am expected. They expect from me a higher standard of living, right? I, 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 I have to be careful how I behave, how I act, even how my front lawn looks like. How my, I mean, I have to act in a certain way because they don't know my theology, they don't know anything about my church or my devotional life, but they see the way I live, right? When I do business with someone, and he says, well, it's 250, and I said, no, 250 is too much. No, 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 drop the price. No, no, 250, 240. No, no, 240 is too much. No, 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 200, 200. Can I do that? I can't. Because if I'm, if, I, if I'm stingy, can I invite them to an evangelistic meeting? They will say, forget it, I'm not coming. I know the guy, don't do business with him. Right? So the way I live my Christianity day to day it has to reflect my theology. So the third level of Christianity is practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. There is actually in theology, you have the systematic theology, which is pure theology, but then you have the practical Christianity. Sometimes we call that applied theology. Because what I believe has to be reflected in my daily life, correct? What I believe has to be reflected in what I do. And you know, you know, in the Bible, there are two aspects of this practical Christianity. One is Matthew 25, Jesus tells the story of the goat and the sheep, right? You remember that? The, the principle applied in that parable was the way people did good. You remember that? When Jesus said, you gave me food, you gave me water, you gave me clothing, you came and visited me when I was sick. All of that is practical Christianity. What I talk here doesn't have any value if I do not apply it in practice. You know, good, doing good to people around you. So I, yesterday I received these pictures from my brother-in-law. He's a pastor in Romania. He's a pastor in, 
he pastored in large churches and he pastored in, in the capital now. And I got this picture from him because he said, Pastor, one of the, my neighbors, a church member came to him and said, one of my neighbors, this is where they live. What do you think the first step should be? Should it go to them and say, hey, by the way, we are from the church. We worship Saturday morning because the Sabbath is the Lord's day. Come to our church. Bye-bye. Is that what we need to do? You go there and you say, man, is there anything we can help you with the roof? Maybe we can. It's raining. The winter is coming. Let's put some money together and let's go help you replace your roof. Your kids, maybe they can enjoy better clothing. Let's put some money together. Let's help them, right? So this is practical theology. This is practical Christianity. And in many situations, that's where you begin. Right? It's not, but theology and practical theology is not limited to that. Some people limit the theology to the social aspect of it. It's not all. Practical Christianity moves on. You know, in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruits of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. The concept is in this passage that some of us come out of darkness, have come out of the darkness of our own minds. And I remember some of my days in my youth when... I was into rock music, pop music, jazz music, blues music, girls, movies, jokes. And I, I will never forget the way I would spend my new year. There was a time in my life when the new year watched the whole night. In Romania, the new year, it's a, in Europe, the new year, it's a big thing. You watch the whole night movies and jokes and music and play with your friends and the girls and the whole thing and eat. How many times? Well, you don't know because you eat every two hours. Go get another cookie, go get another drink, and go get again. You, you eat the whole night, the whole night. In the morning, you're like a zombie, go home to, go to, to sleep. And that was the, they call it the, what do you call that, the New Year's Eve. Out of the darkness of the minds. What a waste of life. And the Bible says that, you know, when, you, when, when Christianity takes, when Christ begins to, is born in our lives, it begins to change you. So, I was watching a short, it's a 16 minutes uh, program. I didn't watch the whole thing, but mm, mm, parts of it. It's a story about some of the last tribes of the cannibals in the world. They are somewhere in, in the islands of Papua New Guinea, close to Australia, actually. And, and one researcher wanted, an anthropologist, I think, he wanted to see, are there still cannibals? And they went there, and to his surprise, to his great surprise, they found that there is this some, as you can see, a tribe, they, they, they just a tribe. You look at that, they put, you know, bones in their nose and big thing, whatever, in their ears, and uh, still have bows and arrows. And one of the interesting stories was that when someone gets sick and dies in the tribe, they believe there is an evil spirit. And the evil spirit leaves in someone, another church member, another church member, another member of the tribe, and they do a kind of a procedure to find out who's the one. They leave, the, the bad spirit lives in. Once they decide who the person is, guess what they do? Kill the person and eat the person. And the point is, these people went to do this research, if Christianity goes to these people, do you think it's going to change them? Would you expect that Christianity will change them? Do you expect that Christianity will change their diet? Hopefully so. <laughs> Hopefully so, right? So Christianity has actually very practical implications when it comes to a place. It changes not only the thinking and the theology, but it changes life in the, in the real aspects of day-to-day -day living. Correct? Am I right? You better say yes. Some of us have problems with the standards. Some of us growing up in a Seventh-day Adventist church have problems with the standards. Then I understand that. And there are a few reasons. I don't want to get into the whole, but it's, there is a natural resistance when we say, I don't want it. 
Other times it's a matter of price. I don't, I don't want it just because you tell me. Other times I am prone to sin. I like it. Because I like it, I don't want to change. Other times when they are enforced, we develop a reaction. Other times bad memories associated with painful life experiences makes us react to standards. And I've met people saying, when I grew up, I was beaten over the head with the Bible, the red books, the red books, right? The red books. And some of us have developed reactions to standards. But are the standards wrong in themselves? I don't think so, because as Christianity takes over my life, it actually begins to change my life. When I was young, I had a number of problems. One of them was I was the bottom student in my class for a number of years. When I graduated, I became the middle student in my grades. But still, I had problems. I was speaking a lot, making a lot of jokes, most of many of them unclean jokes. My relationship with the girls was not a clean one. The movies I watched, the music I listened to, I was into disco music and pop music. And if you, if you want to talk about that music, I'm very sensitive to music because I, I grew up, I mean, I was in that culture. When finally the light began to shine in my mind, I began to change. But nobody told me. I didn't attend music seminars or movies, media seminars or anything. But I, I begin to know, when you see the light and you begin to follow the light, it takes you out of darkness. Not, not suddenly, but step by step. And I was 15 when that change began to happen in my life. And I didn't attend any classes and any seminars and anything. So when Christ reveals himself to us, he takes us from darkness to light, right? And he changes us. A high quality life, it's a life with high standards. Would you like to go to a dentist who does a sloppy job? Would you like to have a mechanic that does a very superficial work? No. Would you, would you send your kids to a school with a very low SATs, most of them? Would you do that? Would you marry someone that has low moral standards? Would you belong to a church with low moral standards? Obviously, the answer, in my opinion, is no. We all want to have high standards, right? Um, practical Christianity and moral standards. If my foundation is Christ, if my theology is biblical, then naturally it will be reflected in, my do in doing good and in my lifestyle. It will be a savior for a savior, savior for life, and it will lead others to Christ and salvation. When we, you know, people don't know my theology and they don't know what I believe, but they see how I live my life. And so is with all of us, both in the families, in my marriage, in, in my business, where I am reflecting Christ is the number one goal. And that's actually part of building. When you build that character, when you build that kind of life, you prepare actually yourself for a storm. And this is, you know, this is the structure, the devotional life. The I mean, this is the whole building. And finally, you have the purpose. And uh, the last question is, do I live my Christian life with a purpose and a mission? Am I intentional about living my Christian life? What surprises me is that those on the devil's side, they are very courageous and they are very upfront. The devil has no shame to expose his ideologies and practices. Am I right? He has no problem with that. I, as a Christian, sometimes I'm timid. I hide myself. don't want to talk to people. Why is that? It doesn't mean that I have to be, you know, do things unmindful. Do I live my Christian life with a purpose and a meaning? Matthew, you have seen this passage before. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The purpose of a Christian life is 
to show others, the, to lead others to Christ. Let your light shine. The Bible doesn't say, well, uh, use your light whenever it's convenient. It doesn't say that. Every day, where you are, where I am, live a Christian life with a purpose. Courageously. And, you know, the best defense is attack, right? The best defense is attack. So, in this battle with Satan, the best defense is actually to be very, be very intentional. Does the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Middletown have a purpose? Do we have a purpose? Am I too direct? Am I saying too much? I am not, it is not my plan to join a country club. It is not my plan to have fun. At my place in life, I can't afford that at this point. I have to be very intentional about what I, why I exist. As a pastor, my question this afternoon, we have a, it's called a special board meeting because I said, well, we better have it sooner than later. It's the beginning of the year. I will ask the question to the church leaders. You are the church leaders. I will ask you this question. What is the purpose? What is the mission and the vision of the, of the Middletown Seventh Adventist Church? Why do we exist? If we disappear, would anybody notice? So, you know, the storm is coming, and the way we live our lives today will prepare us for what's coming, both in, inside of us, in our character, and as, as a group together. My, my, you know, my, my, my hope, my prayer for my life, for myself, my family, for you, is that you build according to the plan, because God has a plan. And, and I pray that your structure and your building will stand and you are not going to collapse. And, and I pray that we together again as, as we know, the, the day is approaching, as the Apostle Paul says, we come together and, you know, you build this structure of your faith and it's, it's going to stand and you build it with a purpose and for a purpose. This is the first sermon for the year and in it, I want to share with you the way I see the growth in a Christian life. The first is foundation, which is Christ. Then it's fundamental principles of belief then is the practical Christianity, and then it's a purpose and a mission. If you would agree with this, you know, sometimes we make appeals. I'm not going to ask you to stand because it's probably too much. But I, want, I ask you to pray. I'll ask you to, to think about it and pray about it and to do something about it. Because I believe, you know, like it or not, willing or not, the storm is coming. And I pray that we will be standing um, today and, and, and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 528. And let's sing.